Um, so, our next speaker, to quote his website, quote, Dylan Beatty designs software, builds websites, and makes music. He lives in London, end quote. That is what he calls the really short bio. There is also a 50-word bio, a 100-word bio, and a 250-word bio available. And apparently, after 250 words, there is simply nothing more to say about Dylan Bailey. Uh, last year, when I was here on stage, I recited some code from his uh, constructed programming language, Rockstar. I will not do that this year, but I will simply hand over the stage to Dylan Bailey. Hey, Momo, how you doing? So, uh, last year, I bought a book. I live in London. I've lived in London for 20 years, but once in a while, I'm like, maybe I'm missing out on something good. So I went onto Amazon, and uh, I did a search, and I, went and I searched for London travel guides. And I got up a bunch of search results. I kind of looked through. I'm looking for something, you know, something with good reviews, something not too expensive, something that I can get in a, in a printed hard copy. And I found this. I found the Essential London Travel Guide 2023. Four out of five, you know, lots of good 65 reviews. Pretty cheap. So I bought it. And it turned up, it arrived in the mail, and uh, I'd like to read you a little excerpt from the, uh, the London Travel Guide. Embark upon a journey to discover the picturesque promenades, tranquil bodies of water, and avian inhabitants of the verdant and extensive estate of Hyde Park. Observe the ceremonial rotation of sentries at Buckingham Palace, the esteemed abode and governmental center of the reigning monarch. The event shall commence at precisely 10.45 a.m., ensuring timely arrival to secure viewing opportunities. The estimated duration for the task at hand is approximately 2,700 seconds. It is advisable to peruse the website prior to attendance, as the frequency of guard changes typically amounts to a bi-weekly occurrence. Now, the thing that the book is talking about there is not the ceremonial rotation of centuries. It's called the changing of the guard. No human being has ever called that the ceremonial rotation of centuries. It's been called the changing of the guard. It's happened twice a week since the year 1656. It does last approximately 2,700 seconds, so they got that one right. Now, the author of this book is somebody called Nash K. Ade. And uh, Nash is a publishing phenomenon. Since the start of last year, Nash has come out of nowhere and has published a London travel guide, a Paris travel guide, a Rome travel guide, a uh, slim woman's fitness book, a guide to maximizing your wealth on Airbnb. You know, this, this guy is prolific. Now, I am gonna go out on a limb here. Nash, if you are out there, click the bus. No? I do not believe that this book was written by a real person. I think every word in this book was generated by some kind of language model. And uh, you're welcome to come up. I'm going to leave the book here. You can come and take a look at it at the end. And uh, this kind of freaked me out. Like, this to me felt like a bit of a tipping point. Like, what do you mean they're writing actual books now? Is that a thing they're allowed to do? And apparently it is. Now, before we get into the, the sort of substance of this talk, I just want to qualify something up front. There is a lot of very, very interesting stuff going on around artificial intelligence. And yeah, we know it's not really intelligent, but it's called artificial intelligence. I think we just got to accept that now. And there are people probably in this room and certainly in this industry who have been spending decades doing some excellent research into things like language models and parameter weightings and generative AIs and all this kind of stuff. I'm not an expert in machine learning. I have no real formal training in data science. What I do is I write code, I build websites and stuff, but I also look at the way technology affects the world. How do the things that we build in our industry affect the world around us? The people who aren't nerds, people who aren't in this room, and how do those people's kind of expectations and understanding, how can we filter that back in to the work that we are doing? And the last year or two, machine learning and AI has felt like this. It has felt like for a long, long time we've been going up, 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 up to the top of this roller coaster, and we are going over the top. Now, the first time you ride a roller coaster, 
in real life, what happens is you get to roundabout here, and your brain goes, nope. There is no way we are going to survive this experience, and it shuts down. And you just kind of black out for a few seconds. And over you go, just like Niall was talking about in his talk earlier, down the roller coaster. But when you ride roller coasters for fun, you know you're not going to die. And that, that thrill, that visceral sense of, I kind of, I know what's going to happen, but also I don't know what's going to happen, it becomes exciting. And when you've done it a few times, you develop a sort of frame of reference. Now, uh, Keisha's talk this morning was, uh, you know, opened with, we've never seen anything like this. And that's true. We've never seen anything like the machine learning and language models we have at the moment. But also, we've seen lots of things in tech that we've never seen anything like this. I'm old. This is not my first roller coaster. And so I'm going to talk to you today about some of the things that have happened within my own career in tech that were unprecedented, that changed the world, and whether we can learn anything from those to help make sense of what is going on at the moment with AI and machine learning. We're going to start here. Does anyone know what this is? No. It's a chromograph CP341. Does anyone know what that is? It's a scanner. It's a machine for putting a picture in a computer, because that used to be a really specialist thing. This cost about a million bucks, and they used to use these when newspapers first started using digital computers in their publishing workflow. They would go out and buy these. I've seen one of these working once when I was about 11 years old in a newspaper office in, in Bristol. And it's this massive thing. It takes about 20 minutes to scan one photograph. Now, you show that to you know, an audience like yourself today, most people are like, I guess that must have been a thing people had to do with. It doesn't even occur to us that once upon a time getting a photo into a computer was a problem. Because the computer, you couldn't look at the photo, sort of do anything with it, you had to get it back out the other side. But photography went digital. Now, this is a graph of camera sales from 1950 to 2019. And this is film cameras. Around the year 2000, film cameras, they hit a peak, and then they declined sharply. What happened? was digital cameras came along. And they went, whoa, and then they fell off a cliff because suddenly we all had smartphones. And smartphones mean all of us have cameras with us all the time, so why are you going to buy a camera when you've already got one? Now, this graph is data. Data is not stories. This doesn't tell you what actually happened there. Because what happened there was the Olympic Games, 2000. Anyone know where the Olympics was held in 2000? Sydney. Sydney, Australia. Now, I love the Olympic Games as a watershed for publishing tech innovation, because it's every four years, every news agency, TV, newspaper, they send someone to cover the Olympics. Four years is long enough that there's meaningful progress since last time, but it's not so distant that there's no valid frame of reference. You can look at the diffs and see what's happening. Now, the Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia in 1996, all the photographers who went there were shooting on film. They'd spend the whole day taking pictures, then they'd go to the Kodak press desk in the Olympic Village, they'd be like, hey, can you develop all my pictures for me? And they'd turn the pictures around as fast as they could, like half an hour. Photographer goes back to a hotel room, they get out their hand lens and their light box, and they look through all the, the negatives. They find the good ones, they put them in a Federal Express envelope, and they send them to the newspaper office. Or they send them, and then the newspaper office will wire them and stuff. But it was very much an analog workflow. Now, Sydney 2000, there's a couple of things were different. One, Sydney is quite a long way from quite a lot of places. Citation needed. You know, it's long. There is a time zone difference. There's a geography difference. Overnight FedEx from Sydney means your pictures get to the New York Post the day after tomorrow, by which point the television has already scooped all the headlines and nobody cares. Second, now you don't often hear success stories about Australian internet, but by the year 2000, the hotels in Sydney, they had broadband. They had digital lines. You could use the hotel's business center to actually send photographs. But third was this thing. This is the Nikon D1. This was not the first digital camera, but it was the first camera built by a professional photography company as a tool for pro photographers. And lots of them bought one and took it to Sydney to see what it could do. And they still took film, because nobody is going to bet their career on an untested piece of technology. And within a couple of days, all the photographers covering the Olympics, they realized that the analog photos weren't getting printed, because the newspapers were like, you know what? 1.4 megapixels of digital is good enough, because we have it now. We can go to press now. And that is what tipped photography over the top of the roller coaster from analog to digital. Within a couple of years, money starts pouring in. We get two megapixels, 5, 10, 20, 40. Now, 
The first digital camera was actually produced by Kodak in 1973. It's got a tape deck. It's got a cassette on the side, so you can, change, you can save your photos onto tape, which I, I absolutely love. And, you know, this did not happen overnight. There's decades of innovation building up to Sydney. And if you turned up to Atlanta with a digital camera, people would be like, why did you bring a toy to the Olympic Games? If you turned up to Athens 2004 with a film camera, people would be like, oh, you're rocking the retro style, hey? Because four years later, digital was just established. It was a professional tool. And today, you can go into a store. I have a couple of these. These are Canon EOS M200. It's a little digital camera. It shoots 24 megapixels, 60 frames per second, high definition video. Um, I bought one of these to use as a webcam. That is how good and how commoditized digital photography has become. Now, in 2000, Kodak, the Kodak Corporation, was an industrial powerhouse. They had something like $2 billion in cash, and that's because they People think of them as a photography company, but what Kodak actually sold was chemicals. They sold all of the chemicals and the machines that were necessary for you to take a photograph, take it to a lab or a chemist or a pharmacy, get it printed, get it back, look at it. Kodak paper, Kodak emulsion, Kodak ink, Kodak film. Um, back of an envelope calculation, I think Kodak made about 10 cents on every photograph taken on this planet before the year 2000. That's a lot of money for a lot of photographs. If you'd gone up to Kodak at the 2000 Olympics and said, do you know you're going to go bankrupt soon? They'd have laughed at you. They'd have been like, no, we're not doing ridiculous. We've got our own skyscraper. We've got the Kodak Tower in Rochester. But in 2010, Kodak stopped producing film. They stopped producing emulsion. In 2012, they filed for bankruptcy. Now, the brand still exists. But Wikipedia now says that uh, the Eastman Kodak Company is an American public company that produces products related to its historic basis in analog photography. It's a nostalgia brand now for people who remember it. And so it wasn't that people stopped taking pictures. What happened is we came up with a better way of doing it. We came up with a way of taking and sharing photographs that didn't require us buying chemicals from companies like Kodak. Now, the other tipping point that happened around the same time was digital audio. MP3 is way older than anyone thinks. The MP3 uh, compression format was published in 1991, but in 1991, nobody cared because there weren't any computers in the world fast enough to play an MP3. If you wanted to listen to an MP3 in 1991, it would take 20 minutes to decompress. Then you'd have a WAV file that wouldn't fit on your 10 megabyte hard drive. You would play the WAV file, and then you'd have to delete it to make enough space to play another one. So MP3 was kind of research interest. Then the Pentium 60 processor comes out, which is fast enough to play an MP3 in real time. Then the Pentium 75 comes out, which means you can play music while you're doing something else, like writing essays. And this is really exciting to people who listen to music in a room where there is a computer. So basically nerds and college students and people working in software and technology. You can't listen to MP3s in the car or on the train or in the living room. All the places where normal human beings listen to music, MP3 doesn't have any foothold in those territories. Till October 2001, where this comes out, the original iPod. Now this is the tipping point for me for digital audio because suddenly normal people are like, what's that, I want it. I don't care what it is, it's got white earbuds. I've never seen white earbuds before. I want it, it's really cool. And I was just, uh, I was talking with Martin over lunch about tipping points and the iPod didn't happen overnight. It came out October 2001. I don't think I saw an iPod like in the flesh for about 18 months after that. And it took three or four years for it to become established. But that's kind of the point when it tips over the top of the roller coaster. And that took Steve Jobs sitting down with the record companies and saying, look, MP3, you're panicking because you can see people trading music on the internet. You're not looking at the big picture here because record companies didn't sell music. Record companies sold plastic. You know they didn't sell music because now when you buy a download, you don't actually own anything. You just have a license if you agree to the terms and conditions. They sold plastic because it was the only way to deliver the thing you wanted, which was the song. And Steve Jobs was the one who said, what if you didn't have to deliver plastic? What if you could sell one song for 99 cents and we'll take 30% and you keep the rest? No trucks, no fabrication plants, no vinyl, no chemicals, no retail, no shops. All of these overheads disappear. You can just sell music. And that revolutionized the way that the music industry works. It revolutionized what it means to try to be a professional musician. It revolutionized what it means to buy, create, record, sell music. Now, the point about both of these tipping points is um, technology took something that used to be expensive and it made it cheap. 
It used to be you wanted to take a photograph, you'd buy one of these. Five euros or whatever the currency equivalent was back then would get you 24 photographs, so you didn't waste them. And you didn't know if they were any good until you got them back two weeks later. And so there was this scarcity. You had to be conscious. You had to make decisions. Music was the same. Recording and distributing music was expensive. I could afford to buy one CD a month, so I used to listen to the radio to help me decide what to spend my allowance on. Now, in both these cases, photography and music, the cost of distribution effectively came down to zero. Now, I was in an event last year, and uh, this guy, David Foster, he runs a, an AI startup in London, really, really smart guy, interesting to talk to, and he had this quote in one of his presentations. He said, generative AI reduces the cost of human-like thought to near zero. And I was already thinking about this, you know, lowering the cost of things. I thought, Maybe that's it. Maybe that's a, an interesting perspective to understand what's happening here. So we're going to do a little experiment now. I'd like everyone here, just take a moment. I want you to think of a purple penguin. What did that cost? I mean, maybe there's an emotional cost if like, you'd had a traumatic experience once. But <laughs> financial, that was free, right? Like, thought doesn't cost anything. The cost of thought, if I now said, show me your purple penguin, you'd have to describe it, or you'd have to draw a picture, or make a sculpture, or something. And at that point, it's the output that incurs the cost. Thought itself has never been the bottleneck. The bottleneck is turning thought into output, turning thought into action. And what we've seen within the last few years is an entire kind of unprecedented breakthrough in tools that can take that process of thought, of uh, writing, of drawing, painting, sketching, whatever it is, and turning it into digital artifacts on a screen or something that comes out of your speakers, video and audio and text. Now, this is some amazing stuff, but we've also just come through a couple of years in human history where a lot of stuff that we like to do like this got reduced to this got reduced to flat pictures and images on a screen. Now, uh, I was watching a Lizette session just before lunch about remote working, and one of the reasons why I think hybrid is such a popular model is it's much easier to relate to what's on the screen if you've seen it in real life. If you've met people, you can have video calls with them, and there's kind of a depth of connection and a bandwidth there. Trying to create new connections, new meaningful experiences based entirely on on-screen representations and interactions, it just doesn't really work for most people. That's why we do this. We come here, we meet each other in 3D, face to face, and we have fika and coffee, and those experiences are meaningful. And that's what was so interesting to me about the fact that AI wrote a book, is that that book is a physical, real object that my mind does not file under junk I've seen on computer screens. It files it on a shelf next to all the other books. And I've grown up in a world where books are correct because they're expensive, so you can't make mistakes. And so a lot of people get paid to make sure the book is right. They have an editor, they have a fact checker, they have a copy checker, they have all of these people. They have, why has my computer gone to sleep? Come on, wakey, wakey. We've got a presentation to do, and you know it. So all of these people involved in making sure that books are reliable and trustworthy, and when someone says, you know, do your own research, they don't mean, like they shouldn't mean go and watch a bunch of YouTube videos, they mean read a book, go to a library, you know, read some, some actual research. Now this book, I don't know how many human beings were involved in it. Um, I know one person exists because they brought it to the door and handed me the package. Uh, I think it was written by a machine. I think it was sold by a machine. I think it was printed on demand by a machine that just prints whatever you send it. I think it was picked by a machine. I think it was put in the parcel by one of the little robotic buggies that Amazon has in their delivery warehouses. Amazon is a trillion dollar company. And Amazon has become a trillion dollar company by eliminating everything that doesn't scale. If they want to do something once, they want to be able to do it 100,000 million billion times. And human beings don't scale. We are messy. You know, we are bags of angry meat, and we complain, and we demand plumbing, and meal breaks, and salaries, and unions, and we get sick, and we break down, and all these kinds of things. And, you know, Amazon's whole thing, their focus on scale, and all the tech giants are like, how do we eliminate the meat that doesn't scale from the equation? Now, this is, we're starting to get seriously dystopian, right? Because there's the whole AI is going to kill everybody, gray goo, and kill a robot, and all that kind of stuff. Now, I don't think that gray goo and killer robots are going to kill everybody. I just I don't think that's a feasible scenario. But in my London travel guide, it recommends a restaurant the, uh, situ situated on the 38th and 39th floors of the iconic Heron Tower in Covent Garden. Now, this is London. That's Heron Tower. That's Covent Garden. 
the AI made a mistake. Now, some people call this hallucinating. Um, AI only hallucinates. A language model is like reading a library, dropping acid, and getting in an isolation tank. The only variables we have are how big was the library and how strong was the acid. That's your training model and the temperature of your, your language generator. There's no, you know, when, when the idea of, of hallucination, no, no, it's just putting out output and most of it is plausible. And so it kind of tallies with our, our biases about what's real and what's not. It made a mistake. It said Heron Towers in Covent Garden. It's not big deal. The book had a mistake in it. But there's a whole bunch of other books written by machines for sale on Amazon right now. There's the Amsterdam Guide, the Mahjong Guide, Resistance Band Training, the Wild Mushroom Cookbook, the Wide Mushroom Cookbook, and uh, the Australia Travel Guide, <laughs> a guide to Australia's untamed beauty and dangerous wildlife. Now, a uh, quick show of hands. Who wants to go out in the forest and, and forage for mushrooms using a book we bought on Amazon that tells us which ones are safe to eat? Yeah? Did anyone have this on their bingo card for how AI destroys humankind? It's not robots and gray goo, it's getting us to go and pick wild mushrooms. But the bizarre thing, we're at a point where it's very difficult to know how to make sense of any of this, because you know, these, uh, the AI and language model systems, they are at once astonishingly clever and astonishingly stupid. And maybe clever and stupid aren't even the right words to talk about. It's just that's the best thing we've got. Let's do a little demo. I'm going to go into Dali here, and I'm going to ask you to make me a picture. And I, I want to see a picture of a ginger cat wearing sunglasses, riding a skateboard across a bridge at sunset, playing a banjo. Now, I've sped this up just a tiny bit, but it's there. Hey, here are the images. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Look at it. It's beautiful. I wonder if it can draw three blue circles. And it thinks about it for about the same time as it took to draw the cat, and it's like, there you go. All right, four blue circles, and it goes, yep. Give me a second, four is quite hard. There you go, look, I made you four blue circles. You think it can do five? Let's have a go. Yeah. Now, that shouldn't be a hard problem for a language model with about a hundred billion dollars in investment behind it, but it can't get it right because it has no, there is no comprehension here, no understanding. It doesn't know that five means that many. It just knows that that sentence matches a set of weights in a model, and when the picture looks like that, it satisfies the constraints and there's the result. If you ask it to write the word computer, it does a smart ass and it just says computer. If I ask it to draw the word computer without making any mistakes, it's going to think about it for a second, and we're going to get this. And that's, have you ever seen like a Cyrillic, Russian or Ukrainian alphabet written by someone who doesn't read or write those alphabets at all? So they write something that looks like that for their heavy metal band picture or something. And if you don't know what you're doing, it looks plausible. To somebody who can't read English, they'd be like, yeah, it probably says computer. But when you can, you're like, it's not quite right. It's like it, it's missed the important bit that letters have to be the right shape, otherwise it doesn't work. So uh, thank you, Dali. We always thank the AIs because uh, my mother raised me to be polite and my father raised me to believe in Rocco's basilisk. <laughs> now, it's this kind of thing. We can produce these stunning images like the ginger cat on the bridge at sunset, and that kind of blows you away because it's an instant and the only limit is your imagination. But when it comes to anything that requires accuracy, these models break down incredibly quickly. How many strings does a banjo have? Four? Hands up for four. Hands up for five. Hands up for six. Dali got you covered. This banjo's got four strings over here, four, five there, four there, and six tuning pegs. Now, if you were going to draw a picture of a banjo as a human artist, first thing you'd do is figure out, well, how does a banjo work? How many strings does it have? You kind of work from a very different set of principles. And it's this ability to get counting things right. One of the things that machine learning models really struggle with is generating fingers. To the extent that you can go online and you can buy a rubber finger that you can wear when you're doing crimes, because then your lawyer can say, no, that security footage is machine generated. Look, it's got too many fingers, and you can get away with it. But for me, the best example I've seen of the point where you see the cracks and you see the abstractions is asking uh, machine language uh, learning models to create crossword puzzle clues. Now, uh, this, by the way, this is what it thinks a crossword looks like, is you do it with your, your wooden tiles, because we all do that, right? You've all got your crossword tiles. <laughs> um, now, I love cryptic crosswords because I love language and I love puzzles, and uh, we take a, a crossword clue like this one. 
and you're looking at that. And when you just scan this, you're like, all right, and uh, you get a picture like, oh, well, uh, clearly Neil is looking at a blue flower, and Neil is very confused. And you're like, blue flower confused Neil, what? And then you start pulling language apart, because crossword puzzles are about, you can read the sentence as a sentence, but then you need to pull it apart. What could all these words and letters mean? And you're like, well, we've got this word confused here. Maybe confused means I need to mix something up. Maybe I need to take Neil and I need to confuse it and I need to make Nile, all right. And you're like, well, Nile, I, I know that if you look at, at a map of North Africa, there's a blue Nile River, and you're thinking, what, if, what is flower? And then you realize it's not a flower, it's a flower. It's a thing that flows. It's a river. The answer is Nile. Now, this is how crossword puzzles work. You've got to understand language at a bunch of different levels. So we're going to go over onto uh, ChatGPT4, and I'm going to tell it Beauty and Code is a software and technology conference in Malmo, Sweden. Write a cryptic crossword clue for Beauty in Code, which uses an anagram. And it's going to think for a second. Dynamic duo beaten by enchanting craft in Sweden. This clue suggests an anagram. And at this point, it's waffling. Because it knows it did bad, but it hasn't been trained to admit that. It gets halfway through, and it's like, uh, um, uh, yeah, that actually didn't work. It goes, here, decoy bait uneven. And then I'm like, no, no, decoy bait uneven contains the letter V. There is no V in beauty and code. Would you like to try again? And it goes, oh, you're right. My previous attempt included a mistake. Let's correct this and craft a new clue without the error. And it does it again. And I'm like, acute body in code. Now, that contains the letter D twice. It goes, oh, yeah, let's correct it. It doesn't know how to say, I can't. It doesn't know how to say, I can't do that. But at the same time, this should not be a hard problem. <laughs> you know, an anagram is very, very clearly defined. Eventually, at this point, it kind of gives up. And it just keeps going, let's do another one. Oh, no, that doesn't work. Let's do another one. That doesn't work. And eventually, it goes, you know what? I, I'm not going to do anagrams today. I'm tired, and my brain is full. And, you know. <laughs> And this, in the three or four months I've been giving this talk, the output of this has changed, because this stuff is evolving so, so quickly. Um, but now it kind of gets crafting an accurate and clever anagram without preparation as a detailed process that requires careful consideration. Uh, I came up with that in five minutes, and I don't have a trillion dollars in venture capital. I just used a dictionary on a computer. And I was like, find me some anagrams. And it went, so there's that one. Now, the question that kind of arises from all of this. There are clearly the models we have at the moment, they are amazing things, they can be incredibly powerful tools. Are they moving us towards artificial general intelligence? Machines which are genuinely capable of reasoning and thought and comprehension. And uh, there's a book from 1989, it's called The Emperor's New Mind by uh, the mathematician Roger Penrose, where he talks about models of consciousness and simulation and kind of comes down to that there's three options here. One you know, artificial general intelligence. One is yes, and it'll be on digital computers. We just need to wait until the computers are good enough. Two is yeah, but it's going to take quantum computers. Uh, Penrose had this hypothesis that consciousness was a quantum phenomenon that will never be simulated on digital hardware. And three, no, it can't be done. Now, I'm not going to talk about two and three. I'm interested in one, and I'm interested in if we are just waiting, what are we waiting for? Because to me, I don't think language models are taking us in the right direction. They're very impressive, and there is a category of problems they will be able to solve, and they are getting better and better and better. But uh, if you are breeding racehorses, you are going to get faster and faster and faster horses each generation. You are never going to evolve an engine. It is a paradigm shift in the approach that you take in terms of addressing and solving that problem. But maybe the question doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter whether we have true artificial general intelligence or not. Maybe what matters is whether the world believes in it, like money or something. Now, uh, have you ever asked your phone to marry you? Try it. Take your phone out, anyone who's got Siri or, or, or Google or anything, and I try it. Um, hey, Siri. Hang on, I need to switch airplane mode off to get this to work. Da, 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 da. You can try this yourself. You've never tried it before. Hey, Siri. Will you marry me? <laughs> it's not speaking. It says, I really like what we have now, where you ask me stuff and I tell you stuff. Yeah, that's the stuff. There's all these fun little canned responses. And Google Assistant has them, and Cortana used to have them. Um, now, in 2016, a guy called Aaron Chervenak married his iPhone in a ceremony in Vegas. Uh, not legally binding, even in Vegas, which I find amazing. But. Uh, 
there is, I think, going to be a very weird milestone before very long. This whole thing of at what point does uh, machine intelligence, is it going to be granted any kind of legal status, legal sentient representation? And uh, let's imagine, this is Alice and Bob. And uh, Alice and Bob, they just celebrated like their 50th wedding anniversary. And um, they're looking good for it, you've got to admit. And they're huge nerds. Like they met on a Unix chat room in the 1970s. And they have a hard drive at home with every message they've ever sent to each other archived. They've got all their old Usenet chats, they've got all their emails, they've got their WhatsApps and their Facebook posts and all this kind of stuff. This massive kind of digital archive of their relationship documented in writing. And Bob has dementia. And Alice is having to make all kinds of decisions about Bob's care and, you know, where are we going to put him? What kind of treatment does he get? And now, they don't have kids. They don't have family. There's no brothers or sisters or anything. And she's thinking, what if this happens to me after Bob is gone? Who is going to make decisions on my behalf and advocate for my care? And so being a massive nerd, Alice goes home, she downloads the Llama 3 language model, she tunes the model on all of the correspondence between her and Bob, and then goes to a lawyer and says, I'd like this language model to be my living will. If anything happens to me, I want you to ask this model what should happen because it's been trained on 50 years of correspondence. Now, imagine taking that to a court of law right now. Imagine lawyers and a judge cross-examining a language model to determine whether it should be allowed to make decisions as requested by a sane and rational person saying, I want to sign a piece of paper saying this will happen. Maybe you could argue the language model itself is just a very, very sophisticated document. Because after all, deep down, it is just code and data. You could have that admitted. You know, now, this could happen today. There is no technical reason this could not happen right now. What happens the day after that, I have no idea. But I think we're going to see this kind of weird first step on the road to some sort of legal recognition of, uh, of machine sentience, A, way before machines are actually sentient, and B, it'll be somebody. It'll be a nerd with a language model and a lot of money to pay a lawyer, and they'll have a kind of good case to back it up that makes people stop and think, hang on, maybe that's not the worst idea. Now, I saw a talk uh, last year by the, the team from Stack Overflow, and one of the really interesting things they were talking about is when they first built Stack Overflow, they knew that Google was going to be the user interface, that a lot of people who used the data on Stack Overflow were never going to make it to stackoverflow.com because Google was going to show them the answer to their question right there in the search results. They were going to copy and paste it and keep on trucking. And they have a team there now trying to figure out what does Stack Overflow mean in the age of Copilot and uh, you know Google Bard and Gemini and all these different tools. And they're trying to figure out how to use AI and language models as an interface between the human developer and the language, the knowledge repository, whether that's something that's part of your company or it's something that's public. And you know, the, the logical conclusion, the question that keeps coming up is, will AI replace software engineers? No. It will not. One, somebody's got to build the AI, and that sounds a lot to me like software engineering. But two, you know, you look at our, our tipping points here. Um, digital audio revolutionized the music industry, but it didn't stop people making music. It didn't stop people wanting to play and sing and go to shows and enjoy that part of the experience. Digital cameras did not destroy photography. They destroyed the chemical business that propped it up. Now, we're all going to go home with a bunch of photos on our phones that we took at Beauty and Code. We're like, yay, and selfie, and here we are drunk in a karaoke bar. But if you look around, you'll see professional photographers, people who actually know how to take pictures, who understand bokeh and depth of field and composition. They're going to take hundreds of pictures and pick the 20 or 30 really good ones, because that is still the professional skill of photography. If you want to take pictures and know they're going to come out well and know that you're going to be able to use them and publish them, that's still something that people can do for a living. It's harder than it used to be, but you used to be able to be a photographer just by owning a camera. You turn up to your cousin's wedding and go, shall I take the pictures? And that's why all wedding photos from the 1970s are terrible, because that was the barrier to entry. Today, we've lowered the barrier to entry. Anyone can take pictures. You want to take good ones, that's still a profession. You want to make good music, that is still a profession. And being a developer is not about writing code. 
being a developer is about understanding technology and looking at the world around you and seeing gaps, seeing problems that you think you can figure out a way to solve. And maybe that's the person at the desk next to you is having a problem and you're like, I could do that with an Excel macro. Maybe it's you see an entire population of people and you think, hey, we could build like a, a no-code platform to monitor um, you know, wheelie bin collections or road repairs or something. Maybe you build a social networking collaboration tool that unites tens of millions of people. It's not the ability to crank out code. It's the ability to envisage the solution and implement that. And also, constraint matters. Kodak used to make these. This is a Super 8 film. It was the only format for doing home video for about 50 years. It would shoot two minutes of silent video footage onto one of these cartridges, which cost about 35 US dollars. This is obsolete. This is dead. Like, nobody would ever use one of these to make video now. But this is the format that made people like Steven Spielberg and Quentin Tarantino fall in love with filmmaking. It's a format that makes you think. You've got two minutes, and it's really expensive, so you think really hard. What do you want? What shot are you going to get? And last year, Kodak brought out a digital Super 8 camera, which is this wonderful mashup of modern technology. It's got HDMI. It charges off USB. It has uh, audio recorded onto an SD card. But the film, the footage, the video, is recorded onto a magnetic tape, an optical you know, uh, film emulsion tape that stores two and a half minutes. So you bring one of these to Beauty and Code to make a movie, you're going to think really hard about everything that you shoot, because the constraints can inspire creativity. And I look at people, I know a guy who's writing WebAssembly games by hand like literally writing WebAssembly in an editor by hand. And I look at that kind of ingenuity, and I'm like, no, chat GPT, machine learning, Copilot is not going to replace software engineering. It's not going to replace it because we are creative. It's not going to replace it because we see the world in a way that it can't. And it's not going to replace it because we rise to constraints, and they inspire creativity. And I want to wrap up today by talking about possibly the most important thing in any developer career. I want to talk about laptop stickers. Now, I love making my own stickers. What I like to do is I like to take heavy metal band logos and make them nerdy, because I like taking the trope of the rock star developer and turning it upside down as many ways as I can. And what's nice about that is that the idea, the pitch, if you like, is, uh, hey, what if it's the Metallica logo, but instead it says metadata? And as a human artist, what I do is I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. All right, let's look at a Metallica, and we'll look at a bunch of album covers. We'll try to figure out. So their logo isn't always identical. Sometimes it's 3D, sometimes it's not. But there's some consistency. You try and figure out what makes it work, and then you try and kind of take that essence and replicate it. You come up with something like this. Now, I asked Dali to do the same thing. I said, Metallica band logo, but it says metadata. And it kind of it gets it so close, but it misses the joke. I like the aesthetic. This is cool artwork. I really enjoy the way it looks. It's funny for about 10 seconds, but neither of them actually says metadata. One of them says metal data, and the other one says metal data. And like the met metadata is the whole joke. Like without that, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. But I had this idea a little while ago. Um, you don't like the Guns N' Roses T-shirt because it's not a Guns N' Roses T-shirt. It's a ones and zeros T-shirt. And I wanted to do the Guns N' Roses logo, but it says ones and zero. Now, if you ask Dali to do this, it comes out with this. Uh, unis in zosis, and uh, ones in zosis. Now, again, it's not far off. Like, Guns N' Roses have official merch, which has this color scheme and this kind of aesthetic. But you've got to get the wording right, otherwise the joke doesn't work. And uh, what I tend to do with these is I draw them in Illustrator and Photoshop. So I open up Illustrator, and I was like, right, so we need the kind of the gunmetal background. Then there's this gold ring, and we got some shadows. And then the, the ones and zeros, I found the Corvita Skyline typeface that they use. And uh, I drew some number ones using bits from photographs of old revolvers and I put vines on it, and then I had a problem. I couldn't draw a rose. I couldn't draw a rose well enough that it didn't just look lame, because I'm not actually a very good artist. And I, this project then stalled for a couple of months, until one of my friends put Midjourney on our Discord server, and we were playing around with it, and I was like, hey, I wonder if Midjourney can draw a number zero in the style of a single rose bloom red, and it went, there you go. I was like, ah, oh, that's nice. So I, I grabbed that, and I stuck that on here. Now, I have some ones and zero stickers and a couple of others down the front, so you can come and grab some of those. But I thought afterwards that there's actually maybe a very nice kind of metaphor in there. There's a creative synergy here. These tools can help us do things we couldn't do on our own. But for now, we'll let the computers do the roses and the humans can take care of the guns.
Thank you.